Well, I want you to think about what is the best experience at a restaurant you've ever had? What's the best experience at a restaurant you've ever had? I mean, just think about like the food was incredible, you know, the, the service was amazing, the atmosphere and the conversation, just the company you had was great, and you just absolutely had a wonderful time. I can think of when we used to live out in South Dakota, we had many great experiences at a place called Cattleman's Steakhouse. Anybody ever been to Cattleman's Steakhouse out by Pierce, South Dakota? He has because we took him there a lot, of, many times. <laughs> Because we loved it so much, anytime family and friends um, would come out, we would make them go out there with us. It was great. It was this awesome place. It had the best steaks you've ever had. It had sawdust on the floor, and it had this incredible view of the Missouri River right out the window. So it was awesome. So we always wanted to go there, and we always wanted to take other people there with us. So I don't know what your favorite restaurant experience is has been, but my guess is that I can probably predict what were some of the main ways you responded to that experience. What are the, you know, some of the ways you, you uh, uh, responded and just the joy of having that great experience. My guess is that if you were with somebody close to you, maybe a spouse or somebody like that, that if you really liked your food, you probably offered a bite to them. It's like, this is so good, you got to try this. Right? My, my hope is you maybe tipped well. Christians don't always have the greatest reputation as being good tippers, but I hope in that situation you tipped well. Um, my guess is after you left, you probably went and told many people about this incredible experience that you had. And you probably even invited them to go along with you at some point, maybe as well. Grab some friends and say, hey, let's go. This place was so good that you invited other people to be a part of that as well. And so notice something about each of those responses. Each of those responses is an interaction with somebody else, right? It's an outward interaction with somebody else. And so if you offer a bite of your food to somebody else, you're offering it to another person. You tipped well, you're tipping your server. You went and told somebody about this incredible experience, right? You're telling somebody else. You invite them to come along with you. You're inviting another person. And you see that the gratitude to God that we have uh, for his gracious provision for us of all the things that he's done for us moves us to very much respond in the same way. It leads us to want to share what he's given us with others. It leads us to want to tell others about it as well. It can move us to respond and express our gratitude in an outward way. And so this morning, we're going to explore a few more ways of how we can express our gratitude to God, uh, this time looking at this, these outward approaches to uh, sharing what God has done with us. And so we're going to look at a couple different passages this morning. The first one, we're going to look at, and then we'll come back to the other one later. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 through 15. And I think I had the wrong page number if you grabbed one of our handouts. If you're using one of our blue Bibles, it's actually on page 1150. 1150 if you're using one of our blue Bibles. Otherwise, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 through 15. And we'll have the uh, words up on the uh, monitors as well. So 2 Corinthians 9... Verses 10 through 15, the Word of God says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. This is God's word for us uh, this morning. Would you pray with me? 
Gracious Father, we thank you so much. Your, your, the gift of grace you've given us truly is inexpressible, Lord. We try to describe it, we try to praise you for it, but every attempt of ours is always going to fall short of the incredible gift you've given us through Jesus. And so as we talk this morning again about gratitude and expressing our gratitude to you, would you help us in this? Would you uh, just root out any ungratefulness in our hearts and just help us to overflow with thanksgiving and gratitude and praise to who you are and what you've done for us? We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in the middle of a short series on understanding what it means to be thankful. We talked uh, first about, well, who are we to be thankful to? I mean, I think when we get to this Thanksgiving time of year, there's a lot of, of uh, expressing gratitude, saying thanks, but we're not really specific in who, do we, who are we saying thanks to. Well, we talked a couple weeks ago about how we express our gratitude to the one we receive the benefit from. So we express our thankfulness to God because he's the one we have life and salvation and redemption and forgiveness and all these things from. And so we thank him. And we talked about why. Why do we thank God? Well, we thank him for who he is, for what he's done for us, and even for what he will yet do into the future for us. And then last Sunday, we started talking about this question of how. How does the Bible direct us to express our gratitude to God? And last Sunday, we talked about... uh, what we called upward thankfulness, which is these expressions of gratitude that go directly from our heart directly to God. They go straight up to God. And so uh, we talked about praying. We can pray and and thank God through our prayers. We talked about singing. And we talked about uh, obedience, how we can live the fullness of our lives obediently and worshipfully uh, to God in response to what he's done for us. Well, Today, we're going to look at this other direction. So we have two directions that our gratitude goes. It goes upward, like we talked about last Sunday, and now we're going to talk about outward, outward gratitude. And so what is outward gratitude? Well, outward gratitude, what we're going to talk about today, is these ways that we can express gratitude to God in worship to Him that first go out from us to other people, and then in praise go up to God. And so there's things that we do that interact with other people as a way to express the goodness, the kindness, the, the grace that uh, God has uh, shown us. And uh, we're gonna, so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today, upward uh, thankfulness. And like I said last Sunday, our main point as we consider this how question, how do we express gratitude to God? How does the Bible inform how we express gratitude? Our main point is this is that the overflow of a truly grateful heart is going to be these upward and outward expressions of worship that are pleasing to God. Okay, living a life of worship is how we express our gratitude to God. Okay, our gratitude is always a response to Him. And so we live this worship out in our praying, in our singing, in our obedience. And we're going to look at two more ways that we can express thankfulness to God this morning. Those two ways are sharing what he's given us, taking what he's given us and sharing it with others. That's a way to express gratitude to God. And then also declaring, declaring what he's done for us, declaring that to others. And so those are the two things we're going to focus on here this morning. So first, let's look at this uh, passage in 2 Corinthians. And so as we read that, my guess is you could pick up pretty quickly that they're talking about giving, right? Financial giving. And so before you hide your purse or grab your wallet and say, great, here's another pastor ready to try and squeeze some money out of me, just give me a few minutes to talk through why we're, why we're talking about this. Because I get that apprehension. I get that kind of caution when it comes to the church in giving. I've talked to, to many people who have shared their frustration that it seems like the church cares far more about their money than they do about their spiritual well-being or their, their well-being in general. They, they just want to squeeze them for more and more money. And so I, I, I get that ap- apprehension. Uh, and so what I want, to, want you to do before you run out of here and say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to this. Just give me a few minutes. Let's talk through the passage. I want you to see Paul's logic here. 
because it's incredible to me. I love this passage because it's incredible logic. And then I want to kind of use this and help you understand how uh, we as, as Rock Haven Church, how we kind of view giving, how we understand and how we approach that. Because I think it's different than a lot of us have had in different experiences uh, within a church. And so give me a, a little bit of patience and we'll get, we'll get through this. <laughs> So the context of what's happening here with this passage is that uh, many of the believers in Jerusalem at that time, Christians, were suffering. They were, they were suffering significantly. There was extreme persecution directed their way, and there was also um, a famine, a severe famine happening uh, around that time. And so they were suffering. And so what a lot of the other churches did in the region is they began taking up collections that they could send to this particular church to help them, to just help provide for basic needs, to purchase food and and other basic things for life because they were having such a difficult, um, hard time. And so what Paul is doing here in our passage, both in all of chapter 9 and even back in chapter 8, if you get a a chance, you can go back and read through all of that. What he's doing is he's writing ahead of time to this church in the city of Corinth to kind of give them a heads up about this offering. Okay, that the churches are doing this and he's encouraging them uh, to be generous and he's sending a few of his partners in ministry on ahead of time so that they can take care of this and and administer it before he gets there. So that when he gets there, there's not this conflict about, well, are we going to do this or not? He's just encouraging them to do this ahead of time uh, so that to avoid that to confrontation later on. Uh, And so I want to talk through the logic here that he uses. Because again, I, I love this passage. It's incredible logic. First, what he's saying here is, God will provide your basic needs. God's going to provide for your needs on a basic level. Verse 10, God is the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Okay, he does this in a variety of ways. He, I mean, if you're a farmer, you you grow crops. I mean, you you have a garden, he can provide for you directly that way. He also provides for us if if you have a job. I mean, he provides income that way so you can meet your basic needs. But he also provides through other people in our lives. Other, you know, and some people need uh, assistance from uh, other agencies or organizations as well. So God provides for us in so many different ways. And so his first kind of basic logic here is God provides for our basic needs, okay? But not only does God provide for our basic needs, but for many people, he provides above and beyond their basic needs so that we have actually more than the basic level we need to live on. And he does that for a purpose. God also provides beyond your basic needs at times so you can be generous to others. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And so he does this so that through you, God might provide for the needs of others. Okay, this is the, this idea of participatory grace that we talked about in our series through Thessalonians. That God doesn't need us to do his work in the world, but he wants to use us. He invites us to be a part of what he's doing in the world. And so what this is saying is, is he provides for some people beyond their basic needs so that we can help provide for others to be generous. And so he gives us all different things, not just financially. He gives us time. He gives us different talents, different gifts we can use, and, he get, and treasures. So time, talent, and treasures. He blesses us in these ways so we can share these things with others, so we can be a blessing to others and be a part of his kingdom work that he's doing in the world. And so when we recognize this, that everything we have is now provision from God for a purpose, we then are thankful to God for that. We're thankful for his provision. And so in gratitude for what he's done for us and what he's provided for us, we then freely and joyfully share with others. We freely and joyfully give towards his kingdom work of meeting needs for others. And so our giving to others itself expresses our gratitude in thanksgiving to God. But that's not it. That's not all of it. What it also does, what he's saying here, is that it also goes out to other people 
who then are the recipients of this generosity, and they themselves give thanksgiving to God. They themselves praise God. And so God has worked into it, the way he's created the world, a system that multiplies and magnifies and exalts him all the more and multiplies worship and multiplies thanksgiving to him. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says, You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And so us giving produces is, is an act of thanksgiving. And then it goes and the person receiving it produces thanksgiving to God as well. It says, so for the ministry of their, the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints. This isn't just about supplying basic needs for other people. But it's also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. It's creating additional worship to God, which is what we're created to do. And so God, in his great grace to us, creates us to worship him and gives us incredible opportunities to worship him as well. And so what all of this is saying, the result of all of this, is that we thank him for his good provision. And others then thank him as a result of our thanking him. So it just multiplies and it multiplies and it's this snowball effect that magnifies and grows his thanksgiving to him. But, For our outward thankfulness through our generosity to to, to truly work, to truly generate and multiply more and more thanksgiving, it has to be done freely out of a joyful heart. Look back a few verses at verse 7 with me. Verse 7, it says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Like I said last week, what matters most, and we're talking about these different ways that we express our gratitude, these outward actions or interactions or things we do, what matters most is the heart behind them. Okay? It's the heart behind it that matters most. And so let's say you make a donation, but you're not happy about it. You don't want to do it. Right? You're, you're kind of angry about it. You, kinda, you did it out of fear or guilt or some other reason whether to the church or somewhere else, if the heart behind that gift is what matters, then it's not thanksgiving to God that you're expressing. If you're giving reluctantly, you're giving resentfully. What, you're really doing, what we're really doing then when we complain about that is, is we're complaining. We're complaining. You're complaining to God that he hasn't provided enough for you. And so you're upset that you have to give a portion of that away. And so it's not a joyful act. Okay, That's giving reluctantly. That's not what God calls us to. Giving reluctantly doesn't express gratitude to God. And so God wants us to be able to give joyfully and cheerfully because our hearts are humbled in gratitude to him for his goodness to us, not because we're guilted into it. And so I want you to know that, that we, as, as Rock Haven Church, we very much understand the experience many people have had with church. I mean, you see these prosperity gospel guys on church living in multi-million dollar mansions. It gives the church a pretty bad look in many people's, many people's eyes. Okay, so when all, they start to see any church is only caring about money. And so we very much intentionally have taken a different approach uh, to giving uh, within uh, our congregation. So you might notice that on a typical Sunday, we don't have a specific offering time where we pass a plate around, okay? And that's very intentional. We want to, underst- want to acknowledge that. You're not going to hear us constantly asking for money. We very much see giving as an act of worship, Okay, But we want that to be between you and God, and so we don't have to insert ourselves into that. If God moves you to joyfully give, if you, wanna, if you wanna find yourself joyfully uh, wanting to participate with us in the, the mission and the ministry that he's called to us, and he moves you to give, great. Go ahead and do that. Like I said, we don't have to insert ourselves in between that act of worship between you and God. And so I want to ask you to do, do something for me here. If you ever feel that way, like we care more about your money than we do about your well-being, please don't give. Don't give. At least don't give here. Find someplace else that you can give joyfully. Okay? 
Give someplace else. I'd also ask that you let us know that, that we can repent of that and turn from that if that is the case. Okay? But if, if you feel like all we care about is your money and we don't care about your soul or, your, or helping you grow in Christ-likeness or anything like that, let us know and give someplace else. And I also want to ask if you're new with us, if you're new with us, I invite you to hold off on giving until you can come to a place where you have that joyful participation, that joyful partnership with us in the ministry that God has called us to uh, in this, this community, where it can be done freely as an act of worship, not, not as a, a feeling like you're uh, forced to, into it by any means. Because anytime I've seen that happen, where it's motivated out of guilt and fear, it's, it's always unhealthy and it's always unhelpful. It's not helpful for us in growing in our faith. So giving should be an expression of joyful gratitude for what God has given us. Okay? All right? Thank you for your patience on getting, <laughs> getting through that. But just as we can express our gratitude to God by generously sharing what he's given us, we can also express our gratitude to him by declaring to others what God has done for us. So sharing and declaring. Declaring to others, telling others what he's done for us. Just like with praying, just like with singing, obeying, giving. There are multiple passages in Scripture that talk about giving thanks to God by declaring, by telling others about these incredible deeds that he's done for us. One example of this is Psalm 75, verse 1. Psalm 75, verse 1. It says, We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. We recount your wondrous deeds. So to recount something is to tell someone about an event or experience that you were a part of. Okay? All of, if we think about it, all of Scripture is recounting the incredible story of what God has done for us. His, his great salvation that he's worked for us. I mean, the fall of man into sin and how sin permeates everything. And then God's redemptive work of what he's doing in this world through Jesus to reconcile all things to him. And that's, that's recounting what he's done. But one key way that we can recount what God has done for us specifically is by what's known as a testimony. A testimony, sharing what God has done for us. You know, if you, give your, if you give your testimony in a courtroom, right, you're declaring what you know to be true and factual about any details relevant to that particular case. Well, when we share a testimony as Christians, we are declaring what we know to be true of God based on how he's acted in our lives, what he's done specifically for us. And so sharing our personal experience of the specific ways God has redeemed us, has brought us to salvation, and even just the ways he's provided for us and, and helped us in so many ways. But one important thing we have to remember when it comes to testimonies is that we always share them with the purpose of pointing other people to God. Okay? He's always the hero of the story, not us. There's a, there's a dangerous way that can kind of creep into some testimonies that looks to give, to take the credit for ourselves. Like, look at the good work that I did in my own life. Look at the change I brought about in my life. Look at this, this bold step of faith that I took. And it gives ourselves the praise instead of God. And so we need to be cautious of that. We need to, to guard against that. If we go back to that restaurant illustration at the beginning, part of that illustration is, is the fact that we really had nothing to do with making that experience great, if you think about it. We were just kind of there. That's it. We were just there and enjoyed it. We didn't open the restaurant. We didn't make the food. We didn't serve ourselves. We were just there. We enjoyed it, and then we told other people about it. The same is true of God's work in us. So testimonies are a way for us to keep the spotlight on God and not try and steal the glory and the praise for ourselves. We had, uh, Liz uh, did this last week when she shared her testimony. If you remember at the end of, of her testimony, she said, uh, when we are weak, that's when he is strong. That was her way of keeping the focus on God, giving him the credit for this. And so sharing testimonies is 
been one thing that I've wanted us to do through this uh, sermon series. And so we had Liz share last week, and, and I've wanted to kind of hear from different voices from different generations. Okay, and so we're going to watch another testimony here uh, this morning, uh, this time from a younger generation, just sharing thankfulness to God for, for uh, what the ways he has intervened and acted and cared uh, for one of our uh, younger members. So, Michael, you want to go ahead and play that video? When I think about being thankful to God, I think about two specific events that have happened in my life so far. The first was just over two years ago, I blacked out on a moving four-wheeler, and when I woke up, I had a bunch of road rash on the right side of my face and my mouth was super ripped up. They didn't really know what was wrong or if I had a brain bleed or anything serious like that. So they airlifted me to St. Cloud. In St. Cloud, I got stitched up in my mouth, my tongue, my jaw. Throughout the following week, God just overwhelmed me with the amount of people who came and visited and prayed and brought me gifts and just supported me through the healing process. It felt like every single day somebody new came and made sure I was okay and prayed over me and figured out how I was doing and they all really, really cared. And I was just supported from all sides, from church members, school friends, family, and others. I was really thankful for how God cared for me through that accident. A couple months later, we moved here. Luckily, I got to finish my school year at Princeburg, but the next year we transferred to Monty. I didn't know many people here, but I knew enough to kind of get through the first couple months until I really met my close friends, and they've really helped the whole move and new routines and everything, and helped me adjust to a new town and new environment. I'm really thankful to God for these friends because they've really built me up and supported me through the past couple months, and we share common interests, and we just share similar senses of humor and we love to hang out and they've really provided me with good company. What I'm really thankful to God for is that he provides the people you need in the times that you really need them and I'm so glad that he cares for us in that way. See, just a simple testimony of the goodness of God and at hard difficult times in our lives, providing the people we need at the times we need them. is just another example of the great ways God cares for us. You know, Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through him, that's through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. That acknowledge his name. Let's not be a people who are shy about acknowledging, expressing our gratitude to God. Let's not be shy about acknowledging his good work in our lives the good, the faithful things he does for us day in, day out.